Welcome everyone to our sixth and final seminar in our Behavioral Health and Tobacco Dependence Treatment Seminar Series. Uh, we're so glad to have everyone with us today. I know a lot of you all have been here through the duration and we're so glad um, to see you again for our last seminar. My name is Emily Koyagi and I'm the Program Manager for the University of Kentucky's Behavioral Health Wellness Environments for Living and Learning, which we also lovingly call Be Well. Um, over the course of our seminar series, we've covered a range of topics. Um, we've talked about tobacco use and mental illness, tobacco-free policy implementation and behavioral health facilities, motivational interviewing for those living with mental illness, pharmacotherapy for tobacco cessation, and best practices in documenting tobacco treatment. And for our last seminar in the series today, we will hear from Dr. Zema Coley, who will be presenting a multi-team tobacco treatment approach, interdisciplinary teamwork. So if you have missed any of those seminars, um, we have recorded all of them and have the presentations and the recordings um, up on our website. So when I um, finish my intro here, I'll drop that link in the chat and I'll also follow up with an email afterwards. So if there's any ones that you've missed that you wanna go back and watch, um, you can find them on our website and please feel free to share them too with colleagues and friends who you think might uh, benefit from hearing some of those presentations. Um, today, please, and um, while we're together, uh, please treat this as an informal, um, interactive environment. We want you to be comfortable to chat and ask questions so you can use your uh, virtual hand raise option or you can just un unmute yourself and let us know what thoughts and questions you may have. Um, the seminar is in two parts. We'll have a presentation first by uh, Dr. Coley, and then we will have time for discussion and Q&A. Um, we always like to ask when you're listening today to think about three things. Uh, the first being your main takeaway from the presentation. The next is a frustrating or challenging thing that you've heard today that you've faced um, in your work that um, you maybe would like to share and talk through with some of the group. Um, and then also something positive that you've learned today or something positive you've uh, experienced in doing this type of work. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions when we get to that portion of our seminar. But um, we can go ahead and get started and I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Coley. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you for those of you who have been with us through this journey for the different webinars addressing tobacco treatment, tobacco policies for people living with mental and behavioral health challenges. Let me get situated. Okay. And so today we're, our last seminar is about two main aspects. One is understanding that any effort at tobacco policy treatment for a population requires more than one discipline in order to be successful. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the interdisciplinary teamwork that is needed in order to advocate for our patients living with mental and behavioral health challenges and to support them in their journeys and efforts in tobacco cessation. I'm also going to talk a bit also about multi-level approaches that have been either successful or have been attempted in terms of understanding the evidence for why we do certain tobacco treatment approaches or policies in this population. So I'm expecting by the end of our discussion time we'll understand some of the roles that different disciplines may have in terms of tobacco treatment, tobacco policy for people living with mental and behavioral health challenges, but also understanding some of those multi-level approaches that have been used and can be used, and hopefully you can consider some of them in your work addressing tobacco use in these populations. And so first we need to think about an interdisciplinary team approach when we're delivering tobacco treatments. And just as a reminder, 
in terms of those of us who might be clinicians or non-clinicians, but the tobacco treatment and dependence guidelines, which were written in uh, 2008, let us know that it is our responsibility as healthcare providers, healthcare people, to address tobacco treatment for people living with psychiatric disorders. Treating dependence in this population is complex because often they have either comorbid psychiatric disorders or conditions, they have medications that they're taking, but it's still our responsibility to make the efforts and to work with different disciplines in order to provide the optimum care for this population. When we consider the challenges that have been so present for this population, we consider the paucity of tobacco treatment delivered within behavioral, mental and behavioral health settings. We also consider that some of the conventional tobacco treatment programs that have been designed and have largely worked successfully in the general population don't often consider the unique relationship that those living with mental and behavioral health challenges might have with tobacco use. And also the current evidence-based pharmacotherapy, and I'll show you some slides about this um, in a little bit. They are quite efficacious for people in the general population and for our population, but the ways that the monographs and the recommendations have been delivered to us often are done in ways that ignore the specific needs of our population. And I'll touch a little bit on that as we go through. When we think about the best practices approach for tobacco treatments, it's very clear there's a preponderance of evidence that for individual approaches, we need pharmacotherapy and we need behavioral therapy. When we combine pharmacotherapy and behavioral therapy approaches, we optimize the success of tobacco treatment in our populations. Typically the disciplines that are primarily involved with medication management, the pharmacotherapies tend to be those advanced practice providers, which can include you know, clinical psychologists, you know, physicians, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, so advanced practice nurses, like clinical nurse specialists, physician assistants. And those who tend to work with the behavioral therapy in addition to psychiatrists and nurses and some others, but those who really work key, whose work is key, are the social workers, the psychologists, and some of the counseling disciplines. But we also have to consider the pharmacists who are clear about the medication use and some of the contraindications, the uh, risks and benefits, and we also need to consider nutrition and wellness coaches, health coaches, because when we found that tobacco treatment delivery is best provided is within the context of a whole health perspective. It's not just about addressing a person's tobacco use disorder, it's about a person engaging in wellness. And so we need different disciplinary perspectives to assist us in helping the individual come from a wellness perspective, even though we do want to address their tobacco dependence. So it takes all disciplines to advance tobacco treatment in this population and it takes the expertise that we have in different disciplines. But different disciplines need education. 
And I think education is key. For healthcare providers, it's important that in the preparatory programs that they go through, there should be an emphasis on tobacco treatment and there should be content related to tobacco treatment made available. In addition, after completing their programs and entering into the workforce, we have tobacco treatment specialist training that's available, which augments what people have learned through their courses of study. And the specific focus on tobacco treatment as a specialty is an acknowledgement, particularly in our population, the higher prevalence of tobacco use in these populations in comparison to the general population. So in terms of education, we need it in the preparatory schools uh, for healthcare providers, but we also need it in terms of after becoming a healthcare provider, we need specialty training in tobacco treatment. Some of the core tobacco treatment uh, skills that are needed include specific knowledge about tobacco dependence as an addictive process and education, being able to educate people about the process of tobacco dependence and its treatment course. Another of the core skills that you obtain as a tobacco treatment specialist are counseling skills, especially understanding how to incorporate things like cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing concepts to enhance our uh, ability to counsel and provide therapy for people living with mental and behavioral health challenges. Another core competency is understanding how to do an assessment interview and how to provide treatment and create the plan in collaboration with the person who uses tobacco. It's also important whether we can prescribe pharmacotherapy or not, it's important to understand the uses of pharmacotherapy as a tool in our toolbox for tobacco treatment. We need to understand relapse prevention, the difference between lapses and then relapse and how to prevent the relapse. We also need to understand diversity and specific health issues. And in context, this is understanding the use of tobacco in different diverse groups, recognizing that not everybody is homogenous, but tobacco users are a very heterogeneous group. And then like the last seminar, an important aspect is documentation of what we're doing for billing purposes, but also for accountability as well as evaluation to know how to improve or make adjustments in our treatment planning, in our systems of care, in order to optimize the success in tobacco treatment. So the Association for Tobacco Treatment Use Independence, uh, ATUDE, is an important part of helping enhance tobacco, tobacco treatment specialist trainings in different healthcare provider groups and their website and the link to it is on this page. So I would encourage you if you haven't been through tobacco treatment specialist training to consider it. Now I'm gonna shift a little bit from the interdisciplinary perspective to look at the multi-level approaches to addressing tobacco use, reduction and cessation for people living with mental and behavioral health challenges. And in order to assist in this part of the discussion, I've used a socio-ecological model, which is a really impressive model that looks at multi-level factors that affect a health behavior or a policy issue. And in this case, we're looking at tobacco treatment and tobacco use among people living with mental and behavioral health challenges. The, the socio-ecological model says that there are various levels of factors that impact on the person's engagement in health behaviors from the individual, interpersonal, organizational community, and public policy. And so I'm going to show you some evidence uh, through different research studies 
about how these different levels impact tobacco use and dependence among people living with mental and behavioral health challenges. So we're first gonna think about the individual level approaches. These approaches typically consider changes in knowledge, attitudes, and specific behaviors more from the ind individual level. And one of the key recommendations, as I mentioned earlier, for evidence-based tobacco treatment is the use of pharmacotherapy. And for those trying to stop using tobacco, pharmacotherapy should always be offered. There are some special considerations in pregnancy, um, even with postpartum women, but the recent evidence, they don't let you do many studies with women who are pregnant. But if women who are pregnant and they are using tobacco and they're having a hard time stopping during their pregnancy, the consensus is that it is still safer to give them nicotine replacement therapy because it is a cleaner form of tobacco. Uh, it's a cleaner form of nicotine delivery as compared to tobacco, which is known to have direct effects on the mother and also on the baby and the fetus. So we should use the first line pharmacotherapy uh, for people in the general population and our population specifically, including the nicotine replacement therapies and the oral medications, bupropion and varenicline. We do need to understand that our population may require higher doses and longer durations of treatments to optimize their ability to achieve cessation. And the challenge is that product monographs that specify tobacco treatment, especially like nicotine replacement therapy, often do not account for the need for these higher doses of medication and the longer durations for our population. A very good study that somewhat illustrates this point is the EAGLE study. And in the EAGLE study, it examined the use of nicotine replacement products, bupropion, and varenicline in comparison to placebo among people with and without psychiatric conditions. And the focus I'd like to see is the big circle in the center that examines the outcomes nine to 12 week smoking cessation versus nine to 24 week smoking cessation outcomes for these populations. And the authors concluded that nicotine replacement therapy, varenicline and all pharma, uh, pharmacotherapies for smoking cessation are equally as effective for people with or without uh, psychiatric disorders. It was based on this evidence that the FDA actually removed the black box warning that had been placed on varenicline at one point. FDA hardly ever removes black box warnings, but with the mounting evidence that these medications are safe, they were able to remove that black box warning. And so the conclusion is that healthcare providers, prescribers, should feel comfortable and have the knowledge to prescribe varenicline and other forms of nicotine replacement therapy, bupropion for tobacco cessation, because it's just as effective in our populations as in those without. But interestingly, if you look at the graphs, even though it's as effective, you can notice that in our populations and people with psychiatric cohorts, they have lower effectiveness with all these products compared to people on the left without psychiatric disorders. I believe this finding is going back to the slide earlier where we said our population typically might need higher doses and longer durations to achieve equal smoking cessation or tobacco use cessation outcomes compared to people without psychiatric conditions. Another aspect of what we do is counseling. 
And with counseling, there is a dose response relationship between the intensity of the tobacco dependence counseling and its effectiveness. The three forms of counseling that have been shown to work for people in the general public uh, population are practical counseling, which is the direct treatment, providing support, and helping to secure support outside of treatment, which might be in the form of quit lines, or it might be in the form of extra coaching or other programs in the community, which can include even the electronic versions um, like apps and you know, texts, messaging you know, programs, things like that. Now, when we look at a study, uh, this was done in the UK in the National Health Services, they had two groups of individuals um, with severe mental illness, and they were looking at counseling and intense tobacco treatments versus a usual care. And interestingly, at six and 12 month outcomes, where they had this tailored approach for people with mental illness, uh, people living with severe mental illnesses, versus the usual care group, who are those who just go to their community mental health centers and get some information, versus those who get specific information and counseling for those of, that accounts for mental health conditions, there was really not much difference in the outcomes. Now at six months, smoking cessation, 14% of those in the intervention group that got the specialized care versus 6% in the usual care group. But then at 12 months, there was really no big difference. The key with this sort of intervention, it says that individuals with psychiatric conditions, they may benefit initially from using specialized counseling, but that affects in the long run may not be any different from those who receive usual care. So more studies are needed to understand if there are kinds of specialized counseling that are more effective for our population. So now let's talk about some of the interpersonal level approaches. This was an interesting study, a network study. And the question was asking tobacco users with mental and behavioral health challenges about what forms of support, family, friends, what forms of support is most helpful. So this is interpersonal in their ability to stop using tobacco. And this study looked at the networks and found that if a tobacco, a current tobacco user with a meds, uh, behavioral, a mental behavioral health challenge had within their network of friends or family, individuals who were former smokers. This increased the odds that the individual, they call them the ego, would become, um, would remain abstinent after receiving smoking cessation treatment. In other words, for the effectiveness of smoking cessation delivery in this population to be optimized, it's important for them to have within their networks those who are former smokers and those who can support them. The same authors did a qualitative study among participants in, this, in the previous study, and they asked them qualitatively, what forms of support did you find most helpful from your family and friends. And they, the participants responded to three main forms of support. One was practical support in terms of being able to purchase medications for smoking cessation support. The second was emotional support, having friends and family members who encourage them in their cessation pro progress. And the third was having individuals who also changed their behavior, such that even if they continue to choose to use tobacco, they wouldn't do that in front of the individuals who were trying to stop. They wouldn't offer them cigarettes and things like this, uh, or things like that. So again, 
family and friends can become an integral part of tobacco treatments for these individuals and can help and help it can help in providing them the support they need to stay abstinent or the support they need to continue in their journeys of tobacco cessation. So let's talk about some of the organizational level approaches. Some key factors in terms of organizations or that we need brief clinical interventions. It's essential within mental and behavioral health facilities and programs that brief interventions be used for every person, especially tobacco users, at every clinic visit. If a person is unwilling to stop, they should be provided brief interventions designed to increase their motivation and if they are willing to try to stop, then they should be provided tobacco dependence treatments. One of the best forms of brief interventions are the five A's, asking about tobacco use at every clinic visit, advising them to stop, assessing their readiness to stop, and providing them with either self-help material, offering pharmacotherapy or practical counseling to assist them in stopping, and then following up, arranging for them to be followed up or to refer them to a program outside the organization that can support their efforts to stop. Now this, uh, this data is from a study in 2016 that was examining mental and behavioral health treatment programs throughout the United States. And it was examining what components of tobacco treatments are offered in these facilities. And it compared, this was a national study. And so I'm going to show you Kentucky compared to the national rates. And among mental health treatment facilities in Kentucky, you see we fall lower than the national rates in terms of screening for tobacco use, offering counseling, offering nicotine replacement therapy, and even having smoke-free or tobacco-free campuses. Very similar findings were in terms of substance use treatment facilities where again, we fall shorter or lower than the national rates among such facilities in screening, offering counseling, offering nicotine replacement therapy, and having smoke-free or tobacco-free campuses. So these data illustrate that we still have our work cut out, cut out for us, particularly in Kentucky, for mental and, behave and behavioral health or substance use treatment facilities to improve our tobacco policy in terms of tobacco-free campuses, as well as our delivery of evidence-based tobacco treatment. As a reminder, the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control remind us and recommend that in behavioral health settings, we need to stop all practices that encourage tobacco use, such as not providing cigarettes to patients and not allowing staff to use tobacco uh, with patients. We need to make the entire campus 100% tobacco free, and we should, we should include tobacco treatment as part of mental health treatment and wellness. I'd like to just pause and talk about Texas as a case example. In Texas, there was an initiative where they targeted the community mental health centers. There are about 21 of them that were targeted and they provided tobacco-free policy within these settings, the community mental health center settings. They educated staff on the hazards of tobacco use and exposure they trained clinicians to routinely screen and treat for tobacco. They provided resources to the clinics, such as nicotine replacement therapy, workplace, no smoking signage, and education materials. 
And they did some community outreach in terms of supporting tobacco-free living for their clients. And they found in a six month period, so they implemented these initiative as components in six months. And they did a before, um, before the initiatives, they assessed the five A's among clinicians. And then after the initiative, they assessed it. And they found that the post initiative time point, there was an increase in all of the elements of the five A's. In other words, if we take a systematic approach within community mental health centers and behavioral health facilities, we are able to improve and increase tobacco treatment delivery. So let's talk about some of the community level approaches. The key community level approaches that have been used for people living with mental and behavioral health challenges are mostly of the quit lines community tobacco treatment programs, and using some form of incentives in community programs to enhance people's uh, attempts to stop using tobacco and actually to try and stay abstinent. So a particular study examined the quit lines, and this was just published in 2021, some of the work of Dr. Chad Morris out of Denver, Colorado. And they looked at National Jewish, which is a quit line provider in the United States. And National Jewish had a new protocol where their coaches, the quit line coaches, were trained to deliver their coaching specifically for people with mental health conditions. And these were people with anxiety and depression specifically in this study. And so they used a control group of individuals who had gone through the quit line prior to the, implementing, the implementation of this new mental health specific um, algorithms or, or coaching. And they found that at the end of six months, there was really no difference between those in the intervention group and the control group in terms of the whether if you tailor the coaching or if you just use existing algorithms. One way we can look at it is quit lines are working. So at least 22 to 24 percent of the individuals remained abstinence at six months after engaging in the quit line. But whether you tailor it or not may not be as, may not make as much of a difference in terms of abstinence. However, tailoring may make a difference in terms of acceptability. In other words, if we provide tailored coaching specific for people with mental health uh, conditions, they may be more willing to use the quit line because you have coaches who have expertise in addressing their specific needs. Another program, and we did this in Kentucky, and it just illustrates a specific point. When we delivered the Cooper Clayton program in community mental, uh, in, a, in two sites that were not community mental health and one site that was a community mental health site. We had the same people delivering the intervention and we found an almost 70% smoking cessation at the, end of treat, at the end of the program for those in the community site. But for those in the community mental health site participation station, we found a 0% smoking cessation. This goes to illustrate that just using programs that were developed for the general public without tailoring them may not be as effective in our specific populations. Another study, I think this is really fascinating, came out in 2018. They wanted to understand what if we give people incentives to stay abstinent? So they did a, they did a very complicated protocol with 661 individuals. It was a very well done study. And they had people, uh, this was up in, I believe, New Haven, Connecticut area. 
they had individuals from community mental health clinics assigned to three different forms of uh, tobacco treatment. One is just pharmacotherapy only. One was pharmacotherapy combined with the quit line. And the third was pharmacotherapy combined with cognitive behavioral therapy. And regardless of which group people entered, they randomized individuals to either receiving some kind of incentive or not. And then of those who quit with whatever method, they in a month period decided to pay people to see if it would be an incentive to stay quit. So for the first week of quitting, individuals had the opportunity to make up to $150 just to stay quit that first week. The second week, they also had an opportunity for $150. And then the third week, they could get $75. The fourth week, they could get $75. And these are the outcomes. So they found that the incentive group, they were more likely to stay abstinent at three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months compared to the people who went through the program but did not receive an incentive. And this is statistically significantly different. So it does suggest that our population may be more motivated by incentives to help them remain abstinent. And I thought it would, I would be remiss not to include one of our very own local programs where we have conducted a behavioral health quit and win contest. Quit and win contests are incentives where you incentivize individuals to make a, a smoking or tobacco a quit attempt. And if they are able to stop using tobacco for one month, they can be entered into a drawing for a prize. In our case, they were entered into a drawing for $150 as the first prize and two prizes of $75 each. So we had three sites that have been involved in our behavioral health quitting wins. The first site was conducted in March of 2020. We had seven individuals participate in that time, and this was right when COVID hit. Of them, one individual quit. And then our last, the next two sites were conducted in April 2022, just this past April. From one site, we had 16 individuals enrolled, and the other, we had six individuals enrolled. And, you know, we had three people who were successful in one site and none in the other. The key with quit and wins, from a population perspective, they may not be as successful in helping people stop quitting and stay quit. But what they are very helpful in doing is if you include them as part of a comprehensive plan for tobacco cessation. In other words, they do get people to attempt to stop quitting. So quitting wins could be very good aspects if you're thinking from an organizational perspective of having a tobacco-free uh, process in place for your mental or behavioral health facility a quit and win program for staff and also for clients may be something that could be part of that programming, uh, the planning of going tobacco free. And we'd be very happy to speak with anybody who's interested in this. So we're gonna end with the public policy level approaches. When we talk about public policy levels, we wanna understand how do policy aspects, health policy aspects influence tobacco cessation among people living with mental and behavioral health challenges. There are, I didn't include this, but there are preponderance of studies in Australia that demonstrate if you take inpatient tobacco, uh, inpatient psychiatric facilities tobacco free, it improves behavioral outcomes among the patients, but it doesn't necessarily change their smoking behavior. But it does improve clean air and health overall. Okay, so policies don't always have dramatic impacts in smoking behaviors, but it may have impacts in other aspects. And some of this next slide will illustrate this point. 
there was a study done in 2010 that demonstrated if you increase the excise tax, cigarette excise tax by 10%, it translates to an 18% reduction in smoking among those with alcohol, drug, or mental disorders. So supporting or advocating for increases in cigarette excise tax, taxes can have dramatic reductions in overall tobacco use prevalence. So we should support these. The second study examined tobacco-free policies in permanent supportive housing. This was done in California in 2018. And this was within the context of uh, the tobacco-free and smoke-free public housing initiatives. And so the researchers, they decided to go into the, these public houses before they went smoke-free and then visit them afterwards. And they found that after the tobacco-free policy was instituted within these public houses, there was a decrease in indoor smoking. There was a decrease in the proportion of residents identifying as current smokers. And there was actually an increased support for the policy, even from current smokers but there was really no change in the residents who smoked. So such policies can certainly improve the indoor air quality and they are supported, but they may not in themselves affect tobacco use behavior. So as a conclusion, addressing tobacco use among people living with mental and behavioral health challenges does require an interdisciplinary team approach to optimize our success. When we consider multi-level initiatives, tobacco control initiatives, they can provide insight into different things that we could use in order to address tobacco use among our populations in our organizations. And when we engage in tobacco control efforts across disciplines, taking that interdisciplinary approach, considering some of the multi-level interventions that have been used, we can address the disproportionate tobacco use prevalence, morbidity, and mortality in our populations. So thank you for your time. And I know we have time for some questions. I've been told my voice puts people to sleep, so hopefully you're not sleep yet. And please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or drop it in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you so much, Dr. Coley. That was a wonderful presentation and a great uh, way to wrap up our series. I think we covered a lot of important topics. And um, so, yeah, let's hear from our group here. Does anyone have any questions? Dr. Akoli, could you go back to the slide where you showed depression and anxiety? Um, maybe about six or eight back. And while you do that, I'll answer um, Becky's question in the chat. She asked if we could get the presentation to give to some of the treatment providers. And yes, I'll go ahead and I had not done this before. I didn't want to do it in the middle of the presentation, but um, I'm going to put the, the link in the chat. Um, put it in there. And that page has all the recordings as well as the PowerPoint presentations. So um, we'll get his up there as well. Our web person is on vacation this week, so it may be early next week before I email you guys the link, but um, we'll get that to you. So yes, please share it. So my question here, Dr. Coley, was it's tailored and, and non-tailored, but it, I'm assuming it was still the same amount of time, whereas some of the literature suggests or shows that individuals living with mental and behavioral health challenges need more than the typical time provided through a quit line 
to quit. So did those marry at all? Are those separate? Were, the, were these the normal quit times? Yeah, that's a great question. So with this, the control group, they received four coaching calls as well as pharmacotherapy. And that's the standard protocol for the quit line. And that's for anybody. Whereas the mental health group, the intervention group, they received an additional three coaching calls. So four plus an additional three. And they did receive the pharmacotherapy. And the coaching calls focused on mood regulation. And that was how they tailored it for this population, recognizing that a lot of them, as they're going through tobacco cessation pro uh, process, it affects their moods. Yeah. So they did make an attempt to extend it, you know, at an additional three coaching calls. But, you know, this sort of, these sort of studies are interesting. Um, Another follow-up study that Dr. Morris and his group are doing is with Optum Health. And Optum Health, they enrolled individuals with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So we're going to see, they haven't yet published those results, but they use a very similar protocol, and they want to see if it will make a difference for people with severe mental illness. We have a question in the chat. Um, it is, is there any correlation between socioeconomic status and tobacco use? So there are many studies that have shown that individuals with lower socioeconomic status all tend to use tobacco at a higher rate. And for our population, not all of them, but many of them are overrepresented in having lower socioeconomic status. So their question is good because there is that overlap. Is it that they're using tobacco because they have lower socioeconomic status or is it that they're using tobacco because they have um, mental and behavioral health challenges? Or is it that many people with lower socioeconomic status have mental and behavioral health challenges? So there are correlations that we call them intersections between the three. Oh, thanks. Great question, Han. I'd also be interested to know, especially for those of you from community mental health programs um, or facilities, what sort of take-homes you might have from the presentation in terms of maybe things that you could implement or have been implemented in your programs. Well, I'll, I'll say, um, I speak generally, we are really paying close attention to the questions that we have in our visits for our, not just our primary care providers and our psych med providers, but also now our therapists and, um, and like the a tobacco screening question and then um, an option to indicate that tobacco counseling has been performed and also like a follow-up plan, kind of a follow-up plan, which, um, you know, which can include referral to primary care. So that's just, you know, kind of speaking to the, um, the team approach and, and just like connecting people to other providers within the agency. So um, that's just a little bit about what we're looking at right now to do, um, which I think will help to, um, make it more of that interdisciplinary team approach and not just kind of everyone siloed off. That's excellent, Christy. And I earlier I sent Emily uh, a billing guide for 
behavioral health facilities in terms of tobacco use. And it's important because I know North Key is an FQHC. And right? If, uh, do you have a we are, we, we are a CCBHC. A or, CCBHC. Yeah, but not an FQHC. Okay. I apologize. If a person is an FQHC, then they actually have the benefit of having uh, tobacco use treatment reimbursable. And so it might be good to see if that stipulation works for the CCH, CCBHC, CCH, uh, you know what I mean. Because um, I know with that aspect, it is a combination of integrated care as well. Thanks, Christy. I do appreciate it's not about being siloed and we can't be siloed anymore. It's really about that interdisciplinary work. When I was in Canada, we had a pretty good program where we had a psychiatrist, well, a physician and a nurse that, uh, so the program was a tobacco treatment program and it was weekly. It was a weekly program and it lasted one and a half hours. And the first half hour was a physician and a nurse team that did the medication management. And the second, the remaining hour was with counselors and social workers who did a lot of the behavioral therapy. And we found that was a very successful approach for our clients. We learned how to do the interdisciplinary team. And we had this model placed within 13 different community mental health programs. I dropped a link to that um, billing guide in the chat if you all want to take a look at that. We have any other questions or any other comments for um, people from CMHCs on the call? Well, if we don't have any questions, we can wrap up a few minutes early. And like I said, I will follow up by email and uh, send you all the link that has the recording and the presentation. And we'd also ask that you fill out a just really short five question feedback form that helps us um, when we look at uh, how to plan for the future. So I'm going to put that link also in the chat if you all wouldn't mind to fill that out and then I'll also include it in my follow-up email. Um, as I said, it, it might be early next week. I'll talk to um, our team about that, but our person who usually prepares the videos for us is on vacation. So if you don't hear from me for a few days, I will be in touch next week with that information. And thank you all again. It's been a wonderful seminar series. And um, so one of the best parts is just getting to see all of you all and connect and hear your thoughts and questions. And we're just so grateful for this community and all the work you all are doing. So we're here. If you all have questions for us or need support or resources, please reach out. Um, we love to hear from you and we love to work and partner with all of you. So thank you so much and hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.